Welcome everybody and I am very happy to introduce you to a brand new session that we are running here this evening on the topic of Jewish education in 2021. This is a new series that's going to look at a broad variety of subjects looking at the reality, the trends, the possibilities for the future. And we're going to be looking at it from a variety of different perspectives. We're going to be interviewing over the next four weeks individuals who have one role or another in the academic, pedagogic and administrative parts of our community whether that be in formal education or informal education, whether that be from the perspective of high school and elementary school, a summer camp, or even from looking at Federation CJA's new position that they have appointed as far as looking at Jewish education from a community and home perspective. I am extremely happy to be here this evening with well, I'm in my home. I'm always happy to be in my home, but I'm extremely <laughs> happy to be joined in my home via Zoom with none other than Karen Gazit. Karen is um, a wonderful friend and colleague. We have known each other for uh, a long time, uh, amazingly, when I first got to Montreal. Actually, Karen was one of the very first people who greeted me here and um, already had had plans for me as she is uh, among so many things an instrumental connector of people here in our community i'd like to welcome karen with a formal introduction and karen um, before receiving her phd in educational psychology from mcgill taught in several special needs institutions and schools including the instrumental enrichment institute with dr forestine she then served as the coordinator of special education, the director of education and interim executive director at BJEC, that's the Bronfman Jewish Education Center. Her current role is the Dean of Academics at Kol Tamatora and Hatsalia. She's also a faculty lecturer in the Department of Education and Counseling Psychology and a course lecturer in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education at McGill, where she's taught for over 20 years. She's also taught at Hebrew College in Boston, the University of New Brunswick. Over the years, she's presented on topics relating to meeting diverse needs in the classroom, assessment and instruction, developing key competencies in leadership. And she has spoken and taught in Canada, in Israel, in Australia. She's the author of the book, The Mindful and Purposeful Teacher, Research Informed Practice for Every Child in Every Classroom and Teaching with Purpose second edition. <laughs> Karen, it is a pleasure to welcome you here today. What a, what a wonderful CV. And by the way, if you're listening, that is not Karen's CV. That's the short bio. Her CV is pages and pages and pages. And if I would read that out, we would lose all of our time. So let's jump straight in. Thank you for being here this evening. Karen, welcome. Thank you. I also have to say, when you're introducing me, I have to talk about the impact that you had on my, on my kids. Okay. So you have a legacy in our home. Wow, amazing, amazing. You know, one of the things I'm realizing and I'm constantly being re reminded of is that people never realize the impact that they have on other people. It's one of the great, almost bittersweet truisms of life. And with the shadow of Rabbi Sachs' passing still hanging over me quite, quite heavily, I'm spending my days realizing just what it means to have an impact on somebody else and to not know about it or to not know the depth of them. So uh, if uh, your children still remember who I am, I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, I'd like to, before we even begin, point out and mention a thanks to the Jewish Community Foundation's NOVA Grants organization because so much of the synagogue without walls project that this is a part of this evening has been made in part possible by the nova grants and we thank all of the wonderful people at the jcf karen you let's jump straight in you have um just completed brand new book it's coming out and hitting the book bookshelves this month i believe 
this month. It's on um, yeah. Amazon. Um, can you can you speak a little bit about your new book, um, the broad brushstrokes, some of the subjects that you focus on, and why it's so important? Why you felt that this book was needing to be written right now? So thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, this is this is an exciting forum. I don't see who's there. I see you. I assume there are other people uh, who are, we are listening. We are here in the presence of, uh, let me just, 5,000 people. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My, my eyesight might be a little off there, but a, a quick glance, it was, it was thousands right. of people. So, um, so the book actually, it, it started many, many years ago, even though it, uh, it was just recent, the second edition just recently completed. And, you know, it really was inspired, I guess, by the students talking about the impact that you have on others. Over the years, um, teaching at McGill and teaching in different schools, I always like to tell stories that uh, really emphasize the power of power of education the power mm -hmm. that we have as educators and a lot of the way that i teach is teaching through stories and students over the years would say i just wish you would write down some of the stories that you tell and uh, some of the lessons about education so that's really what inspired me to write a book uh, started thinking about it in 2014, but it was really a couple of years later that I was, you know, had the time and was able to sit down and say, well, what, what are my beliefs about education? Mm -hmm. um, and my beliefs about education, I want to, there, there are two people, I would say, and there are many, many people, two in particular. So one is uh, a, a educator, philosopher, Pablo Freire. So he talks about the have and the have nots and the importance of creating an ecosystem, a classroom environment. And I think it speaks so loudly to our Jewish values that we have to create a classroom as, as a culture, as an environment, as a society where everybody feels that they have a sense of belonging and where some kids don't feel that they are more or less than others because maybe they have you know, educational challenges or other challenges that they bring with them. So part of it is how do we create that classroom that is, you know, the, the microcosm of the, of the Jewish world that we're hoping to create, uh, where every child feels like they have a place. Uh, so Pablo Freire was certainly uh, an, an influence for me, his writings. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you mentioned I worked with uh, Dr. Feuerstein many years ago in Beta Karen. Mm -hmm. So he was actually a student of Piaget's. And so his philosophy is the important role of the educator. And he speaks about, you know, in, 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 our, in our life and every single, every, every situation that we are put into, there's a stimulus and there's a response. So I could be reading a book, that's the stimulus. I could be confronted with a math problem or I could be holding a sitter in my hand, right? So that's the stimulus. And then there's a response, which is my reaction to it. And the way in which we respond to the stimulus that we have in front of us is the role of the mediator, is the role of the educator. And the educator is there to help the child understand the stimulus or whatever he or she is confronted with. Uh, and that really, you know, a lot of that whole concept of the mediator and the modifiability of intelligence. So Feuerstein speaks a lot about the modifiability of intelligence. It's not that we're born with a certain uh, ability or proclivity. It's more that the educators in our life help us make sense of what we are confronted with. So, you know, and I, I so believe in the power of the of the educator, the power of the mediator, and the role that the teacher has in helping students make sense of the world in front of them, whatever that will be. I mean, it could be a little child trying to climb up a set of stairs, or again, in our Jewish schools, you know, Jewish studies, or teaching a child how to read, whatever the case may be, the educator is so important in the child's overall feeling of capability and efficacy. Wonderful, wonderful. So this book is primarily written towards emerging teachers. It's written towards 
um, seasoned administrators? Who, who is the book going to be read by? So that's a great question. And that was one of the questions asked by, it was published by Solution Tree. And that was one of their questions. And, you know, I believe that it is a book that, you know, the novice teacher will be able to read and pick up some, some ideas. I think it's both a philosophy as well as a set of strategies mm -hmm. and tactics. I also think that for the very experienced teacher, they could pick it up and hopefully benefit from some of the strategies, some of the stories, so, uh, or administrators, I guess, who are, um, who are also looking to support teachers in terms of general principles of effective education. Okay, wonderful. If you wanted to give me some of the, um, let's say, top three messages of the book, what would they be? So you ask such great questions. <laughs> so one is because like I've been I trained to be a television interviewer. This is I went into the rabbinate and now I've become a talk show host for late night TV. You do it so well. <laughs> yeah, we better make sure that Jimmy Fallon doesn't know that you you know you're standing there, able to take over. But uh, so one, as I said, is uh, creating the this, the classroom as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the ecosystem of the classroom is like the ecosystem in, in our, you know, from a, from a biological perspective, that we're all dependent on one another, that we are interdependent, that when a child comes into the classroom, <clears throat> they're not coming as a sole student, they're bringing their ecosystem with them. So they're bringing their family, they're bringing the positive aspects of what goes on maybe at home or maybe, you know, experiences that they've had in school. Um, they're not only bringing themselves, they're bringing their entire ecosystem with them. And how do we create a classroom environment where we recognize that element that they are, that, you know, we have to see them not only as a one student, but as a, you know, as, as, as an entire ecosystem, as a child who has had many experiences and who is constantly living through experiences, positive and negative. Um, and as I had just mentioned before, creating a classroom like a society where every child feels like the have and not the have not. So that, that's one important. That must, be, that must be very difficult. That must be very difficult because any, any classroom has a variety of students and there must be so many, as I'm listening to you speak, there must be so many subsections, whether it be um, ability, let's just go with uh, academic attainment, ability. There, there, there's probably a rainbow of spectrum from those who just find the ability to um, throw themselves into the work at hand and find that it's easy, it comes naturally to them, to those who struggle but are keen and they want to, to those who struggle and hate the subject, who really don't want to, to those who are so lost they, they can't even begin. So there's probably a, an approach of just academic attainment. And then you have uh, perhaps an approach of those who might be able to afford tutors, those who don't have tutors, those who are going through um, family issues. We, we are month eight on COVID right now. What does that mean for stress and anxiety of the student? Again, some handle it extremely well, some handle it extremely difficultly. Then there's the divorced family. Then there is the family going through bereavement. There's the family who's going through um, the, the stresses and strains of what it means for everyday modern life. Then you throw into that concentration spans <laughs> and ADHD and the children on Ritalin, the children that should be on medication. Right. And, and this, this poor right. teacher, this straight out of uh, you know, teacher training who may have a year under their belt has now all of the students. And if that wasn't enough, you're saying they need to take into account all of the students' baggage or right. luggage as well. How, so you're right, yeah. How, how, do you, how do you do that? How, how, so, how I, I mean, I, I think, you know, you could, you could create a poster on why, you know, why our teachers are so exhausted at the end yeah, of the day. They are superstars. You know, they are superstars. They're superstars. Yeah, they're teachers superstars. are superstars, you know, and I don't know that we, we recognize and, and, and appreciate the extent. And, you know, you just, it, it's tiring just listening, right, right. To, 
everything right. that you've just laid out. So teachers are superstars. Their jobs are very difficult. Um, when a child comes into the classroom, you're absolutely right. They're bringing their entire ecosystem with them. So it's not only the child, it's what happened to that child that morning, what happened to that child a month ago, two months ago, three years ago, uh, what they are looking forward to, something positive, maybe something negative. So the child is bringing their, their ecosystem. And then the teacher is saying, well, how do I manage this classroom of students who are all so different? And that obviously, you know, we can talk a lot about how we differentiate to meet students' needs. But, you know, to, to respond to, I think, the, the sort of most important element of, of the question that you asked is, we are qualifying students, not only academically, but we're qualifying them to be good citizens and of mm -hmm. course, good Jewish people, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if we look as adults, and I certainly can tell you, you know, I've been in the field of education, I don't know, let's say at least 30 years. Right. So the, the individuals who I have worked with, worked for, hired, one of the most valuable qualities that they have, and I could, you know, I, I, I have pictures of them in front of my mind, yeah. is their ability to accept others who are different. The most qualified educators who I've ever met, again, who I've worked for, who I've hired, are those who accept diversity. So whether they're educated. That sounds like an ordinary thing, though. What, what, is, that, is that special? Is that something uh, fabulous? I, I, I would yeah. assume that that would be almost the default of teachers. So and not only teachers, I mean, you just people who you interact with, uh, you know, my classes at McGill, when I ask students to work with others, some welcome those who are different, some don't welcome those who are different, want to work with people who are just like themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think the best lesson we can give our students, not because our students are necessarily going to grow up to be teachers, although we hope yeah. that many of them will, no matter what they do, whether they grow up to be artists, accountants, uh, engineers, whatever whatever the case may be, we have to teach them that they will be best off if they learn to work with others. And I think that's the message that we have to. So how to meet diverse needs, you know, there are courses and courses on that. Mm -hmm. But I think most important is, are we teaching our students that there is value in difference? So if you have somebody in your class who's sitting next to you, he may be on the spectrum, or he may be, have attentional issues. If, and, and students model what they see from their educator. And I've, I've seen that. I mean, I did my, my uh, dissertation to a large extent was on that. And I, you know, going from classroom to classroom, I saw that kids modeled what they saw in their teachers. When their teachers accepted, so I'm not talking about how you academically teach kids at different levels. I'm talking about a way of being, a way of interacting with others, adults and kids. When you role model acceptance, you make a mistake, it's good to make a mistake. You learn from your mistakes. I'm not going to, if I ask you a question and you're not able to answer, I'm not going to say, oh, does anyone else know the answer? I'm going to stick with you. And if you're impatient because I'm sticking with him until he's able to give me the right answer, that's a really good lesson in life. That ability to accept people who are different, be able to work alongside people who are different. So the role modeling of that type of classroom is, is very, very important. Again, I'm not getting into how we teach others because, you know, I, we could talk about that forever and that, you know, that's, what I teach in my classes and it's very valuable, but just the role modeling of acceptance and teaching kids that they will be better off as human beings. And of course, with our Jewish values, and it's so much a part of who we are, if they really come to accept those who may not act like them, who may not look like them, who may not behave, who may need their help, so that to me is the value in creating that type of classroom, because those are the kinds of citizens that we want to have as part of our larger uh, society. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's, that's a very important aspect of what I write about in, in the book. And then, of course, many of the chapters speak about education as a science. So we talk about, you know, how do you set up so, you know, education is an art and a science. 
so the art means you bring yourself, your character, your personality into the classroom. You have to be who you are and teachers are all different. And that is, again, that's the value in diversity. But there also is, you know, there is, there's a lot of evidence. There's almost like a renaissance in educational research, more than there, there has ever been before. There's, you know, there's a lot of very good research on what it is that teachers can do to bring out the best in their students. And modern research over the last 20 years speaks about, it's much less about your own particular learning style. That has been sort of debunked, visual learner, auditory learner, even multiple intelligences. It's not about pegging you and putting you in a certain category. It's about what are the most effective teaching principles to bring out the best in students. That's the renaissance in educational practice and research. What do we know about what teachers can do? So so share people... with me what teachers can do. Just from some of the recent research, what does, what does some of that science look like? So, you know, it's being... still emerging and it will take maybe Always. Another, yeah. another generation to trickle down into, into the classroom. For so sure. Cutting edge emerging trends in terms of what makes a great teacher. So uh, there's a lot of work recently in, in the field of neuroscience, and it's like it's a nascent field. There's so much more to be learned, but they're starting to understand that certain, certain proclivities, certain areas of capacity are earmarked in particular parts of the brain. So for example, they're learning a lot about reading and reading has a specific part of the brain. A child needs to be using that part of the brain in order to learn how to decode. Knowing about that, we can help the child become a more proficient reader. Uh, the other thing that's important is that um, bilingual, bilinguals, individuals who are learning to, learning to read in two languages, of course, three languages even more so, are at a great benefit and far more of a benefit than those who are only learning to read in one language. Mm -hmm. So a lot of research is showing why those learning to read in two or three languages are actually at a benefit. Um, in terms of, of teachers and teacher practice, being very clear about what your goals are. So knowing what the intention is, knowing what your learning goal is. Um, there, there's like this sort of fight in the field of education, top down, bottom up. So is it constructivist? Do you let the child explore? Or should you be more explicit in your teaching? Telling the student, this is what you need to know, and modeling it for them, and really slowing down and breaking it down step by step. The field is, you know, explicit teaching is far more effective, especially for the younger student than is constructivist learning. Um, you know, also looking at, you know, executive functioning. We know that executive functioning is sort of sits in the prefrontal cortex. It's the CEO of your brain. They're, you know, they're learning that it develops around the age of 25. So the organizing and the planning that we ask our students to do is sometimes outside of the realm of what they're capable of doing. So if and I ask my kids to put their shoes by the front door each morning and there that's you a go. possible task, I shouldn't right. get so frustrated. And why should your kids be any different than everyone else's, right? Exactly. So there's a wonderful quote that we have to be the executive function for those kids while they're learning to develop it. Giving them templates and graphs and outlines and checklists. And, you know, we take what's in our brain as educators and we put it on a piece of paper. And we show kids and we model and we talk out loud, but we're, we're, we're acting as their sort of prefrontal cortex, as because their executive function. Just so I can clarify the definition is about the decisions that we make. And Absolutely. Whether it's a moral decision or an intellectual decision. And you said it only develops at, at the age of 25? It's fully developed at the age of 25. So when teenagers make silly teenager mistakes, it's to be expected. It's to be expected. Yes, it's to be. I mean, you know, yes, it's to be expected. Obviously, teenagers are able to drive at the age of 17. So we hope that there are certain good decisions that they're making. Mm -hmm. But they really require the adult, the adult, the parent, the educator to help them think through 
the decisions that they need to make. There's another. I, I, that's very uh, jarring to me because if I am growing up in Montreal and I go through CGIP and then university, I would have completed and, and graduated my undergraduate degree before the time that I'm 25. If I am um, going through the system straight, then I may have even finished a master's degree by the time I'm 25. So How? keep in mind, it's, it's fully, fully developed, right? It, so oh, it doesn't I'm mean, it doesn't go. To make decisions when they are so young. People, people are, I have noticed there's an incredible pressure on students today. This is a changing of subject for a moment, but there's an incredible pressure. Mm -hmm. People come to me the whole time pre-COVID when the world was very different, um, looking for job experiences, if I could help them. Um, look at companies that may be taking on summer work and, and I would say to them why do you want to do this and they said I really don't think I do want to do this but it will look good on my CV and I said but you're you're 14 years of age why, why are you building up your CV go to summer camp or have fun and they were like you know I'm doing that as well and these young children young adults are incredibly motivated which is wonderful on the one hand and incredibly laden down I've noticed with this burden of building up a professional looking resume so that already by a very early age they can keep all doors open to them they can have as much choice as they provide themselves with so that when they have to close a door suddenly they are in the driving seat as but is is this this something healthy for children is this a trend that they can truly be held accountable to if they're still not really able to make such decisions are we locking people in at a young age into a career track that maybe they're going to turn around in a very short period of time and say i never wanted to be doing this with my life All right so i'm going to go back to the important role of the of the mediator or the you know the the concept of apprenticeship that they depend on adults in their life to help them make these kinds of decisions. One of the challenges I think that people are up against is the enormous competition. There's competition today that just never existed in the past. Um, there's a wonderful book that was written, I don't know, maybe even almost two decades ago, perhaps, The Blessing of a Skin Knee. Wendy Murray. And it's that so, yeah, and it's that concept that we expect our kids to excel at everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it isn't that healthy. And, you know, we, we're not talking about uh, technology, but technology has a very, very negative, potentially negative impact on students because there's so much pressure out there before you really only knew the people in your immediate environment and how they were doing. And they were probably doing pretty much the same types of things that you were doing. Now the whole world has opened up to you. And the competition and the expectation that you put on yourself to be like everybody else. First of all, kids are not recognizing that the people that they're following, number one, it's, it's a minute percentage of the population. The other thing is that they're probably much older than they are, you know? But I think the fact that the entire world is open to our kids through technology, obviously there's a lot of positives. There's an enormous amount of negatives. I would, and like, I would like to uh, go a little bit deeper into this, actually. I'm speaking only through my experiences as a father. And uh, I, I doubt my 12 year old is going to be watching this. Maybe some of her teachers or administrators might be, but I, I doubt so. I, I think I'm on safe ground speaking publicly in front of the world about my 12 year old. I'm, I'm not speaking about her right now, but some of the things I've noticed through watching her is that there is now an app on Snapchat where you can scan in your textbook and it will do the mathematical sum for you simply by having a picture scanned from your smartphone through the Snapchat app. And when I saw this, I was amazed. 
I was amazed. I, I did not know, this was a new discovery for me. I'm probably dating myself as an old fogey right now, not being in touch with modern technology. But when I saw this, it amazed me because I simply did not realize that this was there. So my first question is, for all of the wonders that technology offers us, and it really does, what are the pitfalls when we are taking these shortcuts by just showing our phones over informational material on a textbook and, and then the answer is there for us. What happens when we can't scan in a problem and then suddenly how have we lost out by not growing through the tools that the traditional form of work would have made us? That's my first question. I have a second question but I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. The, the, so the there's uh... or setbacks. Okay, so there's a, an educator, her name is, uh, and a researcher, her name is Marianne Wolf, and she has a wonderful quote. I don't have it in front of me, but it is something to do with the disadvantage that we put our students under because of the very limited amount that they're reading now. And because they're reading so little, what they're doing is cherry picking. And because they're cherry picking, they're losing out on the imaginative function that reading provides. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself, you know, we, when you read, you imagine, you imagine possibilities, you daydream of things or people you can become. Um, you, you, you think critically, you expand your thoughts, you enter into the world of other people, not to mention all of the benefits of just reading and vocabulary and expanding your vocabulary, etc. So the fact that we do this cherry picking, our kids are at an enormous, enormous disadvantage because they don't have that same ability to daydream. Of, of places far away and things that they could be. So that's a huge disadvantage. Right. The other disadvantage, you know, I, there's, uh, there's a Netflix um, uh, documentary on called Social Dilemma. As right. I encourage everybody to watch it. Okay. And just related to what you mentioned about your 12 year old, they have created algorithms for almost anything. What is most telling about the dangers is that the people who created the algorithms are helping us now break these algorithms because they have come to realize how dangerous it is that these algorithms actually exist, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, and, and for so many reasons, we have to be able to think critically. We have to make decisions for ourselves. We have to problem solve. We've got to figure things out. We have to know what it feels like to not be successful, to not have the answer, to stay with it. One of the chapters in, in my book is on grit and perseverance, which is almost more important than anything else we can give kids, which is the, that ability to stick with it. It can yeah. be very challenging when they don't wish to do their homework. So you know what? I mean, just one, one little, little piece of advice is that you, you know, and I always, I, I use a, a jogging analogy. So if you're going jogging for the first time, you're going to set a realistic goal for yourself. And what you have to, you know, with that realistic goal, you have to sustain yourself to, to reach that goal. Something very interesting happens when you jog for the first time, you hit a point where you can't breathe. You don't have enough lung capacity and you can't breathe. If you stop at a certain point, every single time you hit that point, you're not going to be able to breathe. And part of that is called mental memory. So I'm going to jog. And when I get to that same corner, I'm going to get that sensation of not being able to breathe. What you have to do when you jog is pass that point of I can't breathe. You have to keep on going, even if it's for another two minutes. And you'll realize that your lungs will start to expand and you're going to be able to take a deep breath again. That's exactly what we have to do with kids to help them sustain that, you know, develop that grit and perseverance. So when your child says to you, I can't do any more, your child is saying, I can't breathe. The child has hit a wall. When you say, okay, you can stop, that mental memory is going to be created. So every time they get that sensation, they're going to have that feeling of they can't breathe and they're going to want to stop. What we need to do is every single day, have them go a little bit beyond. So the child is saying, I can't breathe. And you're going to say, just go for another minute.
they go for another minute, they're going to get that, that feeling of open space. Okay, I actually was able to continue even though I felt like I couldn't. When your child says, I can't, our response should be, go for another two minutes. And then the next day, go for another three minutes. We have to make it realistic. But we have to, we can't fall into, we're the educators, we're the adults. We can't fall into that trap of the child saying, I can't, whatever it is, I can't do it, or I need my phone next to me. Or, and we have to say, this is good for you. Keep going for another minute. You'll see that you'll come out on the other side. So that fascinating. You, you actually just touched on in that last comment, the, the second question that I had, the follow up, which was so many young teens today are growing up as digital natives to have a phone with them is as ordinary as having a cup of tea for example, next to you. It, it's as ordinary as having your laptop on. And you might right, have- having what you, We used to call a pen. Yeah, you might have multiple tabs open. You, and and there's, there's Snapchat and there's Instagram and there are a chat box taking place. I've observed that sometimes for young tweens to be doing homework is for seven of them in a group to be doing more, a multiple group simultaneous homework. Now, I, I did not grow up this way. I don't think anybody who is over a certain age threshold where they were in school pre-internet grew up this way. And I am observing these trends and I'm watching how there is, in my opinion, a complete lack of concentration. Um, I'm blanking on the author. His book is called Deep Work. And he, he speaks about how a person cannot do anything well without there being intense concentration, where you throw yourself for what can be hours at a time. Now, I'm not comparing an adult to, to a 14-year-old in terms of their concentration. Span. But without this deep work happening with such distractions being part of, built into, this is how I do homework, this is how I study, this is how we're in a group, there's a chat. What did you get for number six? What's your answer to number eight? How do you do problem solving number two? Is it just me? Is it just me? No, this, no, is, no. This, this is madness, this is craziness. Yeah, so this it's madness. Yeah. Is, like, tell, tell me it's not just me. Yeah, so uh, there's uh, an, another author, educator, uh, almost philosopher as well. His name is Chickaman Halley. Chickaman Halley speaks about this concept of flow. Mm -hmm. And being in the flow means that you were so immersed in the work that you're doing that you've lost all sense of space and time. Right. Our kids very, very rarely, if ever, are, are allotted the, 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 the opportunity, the sensation, the feeling of being lost in space and time, that feeling of being in the flow because there are so many distractions. Right. So and, you have- and, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. I still want to hear what you have to say. Immediately, what pops into my mind? Shabbat. <clears throat> I have to say, again, I, she will kill me if she watches this. My 12-year-old, and this is a function of the fact that my wife, from the day she was born, pre-reading, would go to the library. We, we are fans. We are the biggest fans of the library. She was born in Israel. We joined a library. Immediately, our daughter consumes books. Come Shabbat, no phone, no TV. She will start and finish sometimes three books over the course of one day. And I just think there are opportunities for flow. And she's totally in it. You know, it's midnight. And we're like, go to bed already. Turn your That's light. Slow. Right. So shove a slant, obviously. But it's like, turn your, go to bed. And, and she's in the flow. If ever there, so I've seen it with my own eyes, this 12-year-old who can do a five-hour stretch and go through a couple of books. It's about giving them the opportunity. Absolutely. I was going to say that's the point because had 
you know, had your daughter not had the opportunity, or I mean, she has this opportunity every Shabbat, she would not have developed that ability to be in the flow. Mm -hmm. We get better, and this is something else that, you know, evidence-based practice that I write about. We get better when we do things well, deliberate practice. So when we're able to do things well, practice makes permanent, doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So we need experiences doing things well and often. And that becomes... Um, you, you want that feeling over and over again. Once you get that feeling of I do it well and I'm in the flow, you want to repeat that great feeling. So because of Shabbat, she's had that opportunity to experience what it's like and she wants that and she you know, enjoys it and appreciates it. And she does go to these plays. Like she is able to daydream in the most beautiful way because she reads books. So, you know, and that's, that's the beauty of, of Shabbat. Um, just, you know, and just going back to technology for a second, just because we have the capacity to do something, it doesn't mean that it's good for us to do it. And I think that's what, what adults and educators and parents have to be aware of and guardians. And just because technology has given us the ability to do it doesn't mean that it's good for kids. So we have to be really vigilant to say what what is healthy. So, you know, without technology, we wouldn't be on Zoom right now. Obviously, there's so many benefits. But kids depend on us to guide them, even though they fight us. We can't forget that they need us to be able to guide them in the right direction. And a lot of that means deciding for them how much technology is safe and how much technology is too much. And, it, you know, I, I, I how have... How much is too much? Let me push you a little. How much is, how much is too much? You know, so... Um, and the other, the other person who I think speaks about this brilliantly is, uh, is Noah Harari. He's God. He, he speaks about this very well. And he talks about technology as one of the greatest threats to young people. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I really do believe it for all the wonders of technology. And there are wonders. And again, there's so much that we would not be able to do and medical wonders and so much that we can now do that we weren't able to. But how much is too much? So one thing I think that's most important is an age thing. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, parents have to decide at what point they think children should have a phone. A lot of people say that, you know, you should probably wait until your child is in high school. Elementary school is too young. Um, so it's, it's, it's an age. At what time, at what point in their, in their development are you going to allow them to have, you know, and I believe it, there's an addiction. We all know that there's an addiction to technology. So to keep them away from it as long as possible is, is important. The other thing is near bedtime to make sure that they have, kids need downtime. Um, there's a lot of research on the ability to self-regulate. Self-regulate is not to be overstimulated by your environment and technology is, is overstimulating. So when kids are on technology before bed, very often their sleep is not soothing because they're so worked up. Mm -hmm. So to keep them away from technology, um, you know, probably at least, at least an hour, just to have a nice routine where they're away from their technology, there's downtime. Um, and then, I mean, kids get home at 4, 4.30 and you want them away and kids need 10 hours of sleep. So, you know, if you, if you sort of do the math, they don't have a whole lot of time that they there should. Are, there are some real challenges. Could I ask you, and we'll perhaps close with this, could you share with me some of the things you're optimistic about in terms of the future? With the challenges that children face, and young adults with technology, with education, with schooling, and the realities that we now know through our understanding of the literature and the science that is coming out from this, what are you most optimistic about in terms of the future? So what I'm most optimistic, and again, you know, I, um, I see myself as, uh, I, I love education. I see myself as, as an educator. I'm passionate about education. And the, the field, like I said, there's a renaissance of knowledge the field of neuroscience is, it's a budgeting field, it's new, we're learning so much, but the research in the area of neuroscience is gonna help us figure out how to support kids with challenges. Mm -hmm. We're learning a lot about um, 
how to help those who have attentional challenges, how to help um, kids who can't read. So it's really difficult to not be able to read, to have a reading disability, but the field of neuroscience is informing us so much about how we can support kids. Having, having a difficulty, having a disability, having a challenge obviously is extremely burdensome on the child and on the family. The amount, and it really is sort of marrying neuroscience and education, but there's so much incredible, incredible research about how kids are learning and how to help them learn. So the marriage between neuroscience and what goes on in the classroom, um, you know, I believe we're doing a much better job today understanding kids who are on the spectrum, who, you know, who have attentional issues, who have reading challenges, other learning challenges. To me, that's extremely optimistic because kids who really struggled years ago are now um, in a much better place in terms of uh, our understanding of what they need from, from the educator. Thank you. Thank and you. There are other, we'll, we'll leave it at that, but I think we should be optimistic. I think kids are unbelievably talented today, right? Mm -hmm. More so than we were, you know, we have got great talents. We have a question that's come in on the topic of downtime before bed, how do you answer your child if they say that they're listening to music on their device? You, you can't, you get, them a, you get them a record player. You get them an old fashioned, I, I mean that, because you, know, you can hold on to something that has addictive power and capacity. It's, it's, almost, it's, it's not fair for the child. It's too, it requires too much willpower. You know, there's that marshmallow experiment. Yeah that we know of, right? And you see, when you say to a child, wait 15 minutes and you'll get two, it is exhausting to, to find, to, to use those strategies that will enable you to hold off and not eat the, the marshmallow. So it's the same thing with the phone. So you, you know, you, if you wanna to listen to music, there are so many other ways to get them the ability to listen to music. And you know, there's, uh, you, you, could, you can actually find record players now. There's a return of the record player, believe it or not. I right. saw one at Indigo. So you, you, they could listen to music they don't need their, um, their um, iPhones. Fascinating, thank you. Dr. Karen Gazit, I'd like to thank you so much for this uh, wonderful interview, discussion, conversation, and I, uh, I'm very uh, grateful to you for sharing your time, your wisdom, your knowledge, and also ending on a, on a very positive note that you feel that with the emerging trends in neuroscience, how that is coming together with education, there are so many more opportunities to help those students with challenges, disabilities, and uh, those who might have ordinarily fallen through the cracks to be able to become be better learners. Thank you for your time. Thank you for everything that you do. And uh, thank you for asking such good questions. I'm sure everybody who was listening gained, uh, gained tremendously. I'd like to also once again thank the uh, Jewish Community Foundation and the Nova Grants who have helped uh, enable tonight's program. And uh, have a very good night, Karen. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>